Well, hello everyone, welcome. I'm Annie Jaworska, Rogers Behavioral Health's Outreach Manager for the Eastern Service Area. And I am the moderator for today's webinar. What to know about exposure therapy and medications for treating eating disorders, a practical primer. Joining me today are Dr. Brad E.R. Smith, Medical Director of Rogers's Oconomowoc Campus and Eating Disorder Recovery Services, and Dr. Caitlin Hill, Clinical Supervisor of Adult Eating Disorder Recovery Services. Welcome to you both. Before we get started, I want to give our participants a quick overview of the format. The webinar is scheduled for 90 minutes, and to receive CE credits, you must be logged into the webinar for the entire program. A PDF of the PowerPoint slides and list of references will be available immediately after the program via an email with a link to your personal dashboard on ce-go.com. In addition, a recording of the webinar will be published on the resources section of our website within the next day or two for you to rewatch. Our speakers will give a 70 to 75 minute presentation and following the presentation, I will facilitate a Q&A session. During the presentation, please refrain from using the chat feature as it is a distraction to the presenters and other participants. If you would like to ask our speakers a question during the presentation, please use the Q&A button, not the chat button, to send me a message. At the bottom of your screen, you simply click on the Q&A button on the Zoom taskbar. I will review the questions submitted, then the presenters will address them during the Q&A portion of the webinar. And now I'll turn it over to our presenters. All right, thank you so much, Annie. Um, welcome everyone today. We're so glad that you're joining us. Uh, my name is Caitlin Hill. And like Annie mentioned, I'm the clinical supervisor for our residential and inpatient adult eating disorder services at Rogers Behavioral Health. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and my privileges include being a white cishet female. Um, I occupy a smaller able body, and I also have economic and educational privilege as well. Um, starting up with our presentation in terms of disclosures, no one involved in the presentation today has any financial relationship with any products or services. Um, here's a quick review of the learning objectives of this talk. We're going to hit on all of these today. And for our webinar today, we're going to be focusing on both exposure therapy and medication strategies for eating disorders. You can see the breakdown of topics that we'll cover here on this slide. Um, both of these talks could have easily filled the full time for this webinar today. Um, speaking for my part, just doing exposure therapy for eating disorders could be a full day workshop if we wanted to go through the nuances. Um, however, we thought that it would be, this webinar offered a really unique opportunity for us to bring the world of psychiatry and psychology together in a way that often isn't done in trainings on eating disorders, um, and particularly those focus on exposure therapy. So I've been going to conferences on eating disorders um, and seeking out talks on exposure therapy for eating disorders since about 2009. And I don't think I've ever seen these discussed in tandem. Um, Dr. Smith is great at what he does. Um, we work together in our residential services and we just thought that that would be a really great opportunity to bring to this webinar. Um, and with that, we will get started. So exposure therapy is a transdiagnostic approach. Um, it's appropriate to use when working across different eating disorders. So the principles and the processes that we talk about today are going to be relevant for your patients um, who come in with anorexia, bulimia, binge eating, 
Um, but also with eating disorders that aren't centered around body image as well, like ARFID. Um, these exposure therapy is one of the leading recommendations in treating ARFID. And so I think I've tried to include examples across disorders. I think it's, there's going to be more in the body image realm, but I just wanted to plug that of like all of these principles are going to be the same approaches and the same way of conceptualizing the treatment as you would um, with other concerns like ARFID. Um, I'm assuming that since you're all here today, you have some interest in incorporating exposure therapy into your practice. So I'm not going to spend too much time going through the rationale for this, um, but I did want to note a couple key recent articles that have been published that um, are great resources if you want a deeper dive. Um, the main one is one that came out really recently in 2021. This is the Schomburg et al. paper. This will be in the references section that you receive at the, after this presentation. Strongly recommend checking that out. It's gonna, that one focuses on a review of like the theoretical and conceptual rationale for using exposure therapy with eating disorders. And also talking about um, some, of, some of the experts in the field who are starting to actually consider, maybe we should have an anxiety-driven model of eating disorders and their etiology. Um, so that is a great resource. There's also a recent article from 2020 by Butler and Heimberg that's also going to be on that references page. And that reviews all of the current research support for exposure therapy for eating disorders. It's a very honest review talking about the current state in the field and the current gaps that we still need to fill in terms of how effective this is, um, the best ways to utilize exposure therapy, when to utilize it. There's a lot that we still are learning about integrating exposure therapy into practice with eating disorders. Um, and that is a great place to start if you're interested in the current literature. Um, some of the, the highlights here in terms of why we consider exposure therapy for eating disorders. One, there's a lot of conceptual overlap between eating disorders and anxiety. We see, we see similar like safety, the use of safety behaviors is similar. The preoccupation with feared consequences and feared cues is similar. The functional relationship between those two is similar in eating disorders as it is with anxiety. We see both the feared consequences and feared cues and those safety behaviors maintaining anxiety around those. Um, we also see really high rates of comorbidity with anxiety disorders for folks with eating disorders. I believe the research is showing about 60 to 70% of folks with eating disorders um, have at least a, one diagnosis of anxiety um, over the course of their lifetime. We also, there is also research that is supporting the use of exposure therapy. There's research looking at specific exposure, um, like ex exposures, so mere exposure or collaborative weight, open weighing. Um, binge cue exposures, those are things that have been looked at in the field. Um, and so we're seeing that those things are proving to be effective. Um, and now we just need to expand that literature base to really understand the when and why um, to integrate it. Um, exposures are often included in evidence-based treatments for eating disorders already. So when you look at the protocols for CBT for eating disorders and FBT, in particular with CBT for eating disorders, when you look through some of the components, it may not say exposure, but exposure is included in that. So we talk about breaking food rules. We talk about weighing in an open way. We talk about many things like that, where it's clear that that's an exposure for our patients if we conceptualize it from the standpoint of exposure therapy. One word of caution that I wanna mention is um, there is not current research right now to support the use of exposure therapy as a standalone treatment. So usually the way that we're integrating exposure therapy is like an adjunct to a treatment. We're adding it in and using it within the context of an evidence-based protocol for eating disorders like cognitive behavior therapy for eating disorders or family-based therapy for eating disorders. We're also usually incorporating values-based interventions and motivational components to help address some of that ambivalence that a lot of our patients feel about um, their eating disorder and recovery. So just wanted to mention that before we jump in. This is a quick overview of starting exposure therapy. Um, this is gonna be the same as what you would do if you were gonna be using exposure therapy for anxiety disorders. You're gonna to wanna to start with a comprehensive clinical assessment, 
you really want to hone in on that psychoed and helping a patient understand the rationale for using exposure. This is hugely important for um, getting buy-in at the start of treatment. So we want to spend a lot of time helping them understand why we're using this, why it's beneficial. We're going to do an in-depth functional assessment. That's what we're going to um, spend most of the time or big bulk of this presentation talking about today is that functional assessment. And then from that, we're still going to have a similar focus on the response prevention of exposure, uh, create a hierarchy, and then jump into exposures with patients. Um, it's really important that, one, we're doing those in sessions, but more importantly, that patients are doing the exposure outside of session. That's where we're really going to get the benefit. So we're going to start with the talk about functional assessment. Um, this is going to be your foundation for really developing your treatment plan around how to address um, eating disorder symptoms and behaviors and determining if exposure is, is relevant or is appropriate to use and then how to develop the hierarchy around that if it is. So similar to how we approach exposure therapy for anxiety, we always wanna start with the functional assessment of the fear. Really understanding what the fear cues are, working to understand the patient's feared consequences, and the behaviors that they're using to try to manage their anxiety about those feared consequences in the short term. Um, we also really wanna understand what that function of that behavior is for them. We do this collaboratively with the patient. I like to start by in one of the, maybe the first or second session, starting to go through this process with them in session and helping them understand the connections between the fear cue, the consequence, the, the safety behavior they may have developed to help avoid that anxiety. And once a patient understands that, I found it really helpful to assign, actually assign this as homework. Um, so what, what we do here at Rogers is to give them a worksheet that follows this format. So it has this table, we go through those examples together, and then allow them some time outside of session to really think and reflect on this. Most of our patients haven't really thought about the function of their behaviors before. Um, it's not something that we often think about just naturally. Um, so it can be a little disarming and non-threatening to just allow some space for them to really reflect on that and then bring it back to session and talk through um, what they came up with and what they've started to notice in their own behavior. Um, we then take all of that information and we use that to create the exposure hierarchy, start coming up with different ideas to start trying to target and challenge these fears, working on resisting these safety behaviors that we've identified. Um, and we take that same approach regardless of diagnosis. Um, and so now we're going to go through talking about each component of this functional assessment, um, including the fear cues, consequences, and safety behaviors that we find are more common in our patients. So in the next two slides, I've identified a few of the common themes of exposures we end up often incorporating for folks with eating disorders. Um, and these are around like the feared cues that are really common. So really common that we're doing exposures around feared foods. Um, eating situations is really common, body image concerns, um, on the next slide, we'll talk about internal stimuli, environmental or social stimuli, as well as binge eating or purging. Those are just a few of the most common. There's obviously going to be other things that might be coming up for your patients. Um, those are just some of the more common themes that we find. Um, we want to get as full of a list as possible of all the different situations, stimuli, sensations, all of those things that are provoking anxiety or distress and triggering those eating disorder thoughts or behaviors. And you really want to pick apart that feared situation or trigger. Like what are all of the different variables that might impact the level of anxiety for a patient? So just looking at feared eating situations, um, someone might say, well, like I, I get really scared when I'm um, in a group. And we could take that at face value and build some exposures around eating in a group, but there's likely going to be a bunch of other variables in there that are going to impact anxiety, like how many people are present? Is there, are they in control over what they're eating? Did they cook it? Do they know everything that went into what they're eating versus it being a friend's house that's cooking for them? Um, is it a place that they are familiar with or feel safe or comfortable versus a novel place that maybe feels scary, um, scarier to them? or other like more idiosyncratic bites. Am I the first person to finish in that group or am I the last? Am I eating the same thing as other people? So there's so many different variables that we're thinking about 
and helping them to identify what are the things that impact their anxiety. Um, for assessing feared foods, it can be really helpful to use a checklist. Uh, that's, there's so many foods out there. So we find it really helpful to have a patient just go through the feared food checklist. That's a handout that you'll receive at the end of this um, presentation. That's a, the checklist that we're sending out is one that we've created internally. There's also feared food checklists that you can find online that are, that are often used. Um, and this just allows the patient to go through and rate their anxiety for like hundreds of different foods and gives you a sense of um, creating a hierarchy specific just around the foods that are being avoided. Um, and this is the case too for folks with ARFID. So it doesn't have to be just fear of food because of weight gain. It could be, I'm afraid of these foods because I'm afraid of choking or I'm afraid of vomiting. Whatever the fears are, maybe it's like the taste or texture feels off. So I don't wanna eat those foods. Um, regardless of the reason, we can create a hierarchy around those avoided foods. With exposures, as the patient gains more mastery with one exposure theme, um, so let's say, you know, a patient's been working on eating some pizza and they're getting pretty solid with that. Separate from that, we're also working on some body image concerns and, learn, and being able to wear um, like more revealing clothing or like a swimsuit. Um, eventually where we want to get to with a patient is being able to combine different feared cues into exposures. So being able, eventually being able to go to the beach, eat a slice of pizza while you're wearing a bikini on a public beach, maybe while the therapist is there not eating pizza, maybe they have a cover up on and they're eating a fruit salad. Um, so in that exposure, we're targeting like five, potentially like five different fear cues there. Um, and ultimately that's what we're wanting to get to, but usually we're starting with doing the individual exposure separately first and then start to combine. A few things to highlight on this side, um, in terms of internal stimuli, physical sensations in the body can be a really big one. Um, so thinking about those feelings of fullness, nausea, we notice that a lot when folks are in that weight restoration phase, um, getting used to normalized eating again, um, also, especially for folks who were working on compensatory behaviors like purging or over exercise, those internal cues are often a trigger for those urges. Um, as are eating disorder related thoughts or preoccupations. So this falls under that worrisome thought bullet there. Um, one natural response of sustained under eating or weight suppression is increased preoccupation with food. Um, and that can be really distressing for our patients and trigger some fears of loss of control or other things that can lead to some of those safety behaviors. Regarding the binge eating or purge cues, um, some of, in terms of the emotional antecedents to binge eating that I have listed there, um, those can be any strong emotion. Um, it could be, for a lot of people, it's negative emotional experiences. Um, so really good to ex like explore that further with your patients to see what that is for them. And I'm realizing now I didn't really, I didn't, I didn't provide a preface. So I'm gonna be skipping through some of these slides faster um, just to be able to accommodate abbreviating this presentation so that we can provide both the medication side and exposure. So if there's any pieces that you wanna talk about more, you can always add that into the chat um, or add questions about that for the Q&A. Moving on to feared consequences. It's so critical to identify the specific feared consequence that that person is um, experiencing or that person believes is gonna happen and to do that across fear cues, including feared foods. It can be easy to just kind of take those fears at face value and move forward with building the hierarchy, but we really need to understand what's the core underlying fear here um, in order to help fully address that person's concerns. So you can see here, like. With the feared foods, some people might report that classic fear of weight gain, whereas there's a number of other fears that someone might report. All right, so downward arrows, kind of going back to exposure basics here, we wanna use the downward arrow to help us identify the underlying core fears. This is more important for some fears than others. If you're finding yourself stuck on how to create an exposure around a fear, um, or a feared consequence, that can sometimes be a sign that we haven't really gotten to the bottom of the fear and really understanding what's underlying it. Um, not always, but sometimes that's a flag for me. Um, in this diagram, we have, we're gonna be focusing on 
the fear cue of eating this large multi-layer club sandwich. That's gonna be our example for this. Um, and so we have this as the fear cue, and then we have three different patients. And we're gonna show, I'm gonna show a downward arrow for the feared consequence of eating that sandwich for each of these patients. And I use this, I'm gonna use this example to illustrate three different things. And we'll start with the first one. So the first one is that different patients can have very different feared consequences to the same fear cue, similar to other anxiety disorders. So I want you to look at patient number one and patient number two for this piece. Patient number one represents more of a traditional eating disorder fear. Um, they're afraid of getting fat, they're afraid of gaining weight. Whereas patient number two represents someone um, who seems like might be presenting with ARFID um, who, or a specific phobia, who's afraid of choking and dying. Um, within exposure therapy, we wanna test out the feared consequence to see if that's coming true. Um, so that's part of this inhibitory learning approach and understanding of exposure is really trying to challenge, like what's the expected outcome and what's the actual outcome? And while we, part of it could be helping all of these patients start to build up to eating this multi-layer sandwich, we also want to be in more of like a, maybe a habituation model. We really want to test out the fear cue. So what do you predict is going to happen when you eat this? And let's see if it happens after. And does it happen to the same um, degree that you predicted? We have to understand the fear consequence in order to do that. Um, the second thing that I want to illustrate is there may be more behind the feared consequence than what the patient originally reports. So I'm going to look at patient number one and patient number three for this. Um, both patients initially reported the same feared consequence of getting fat. This is one of the more common things that you'll hear patients say. Um, it's often that or I am fear that I'm going to gain weight. And it's one of those things that I think can easily trip us up as clinicians because we can be really quick to accept this at face value. Um, one, because we understand that for folks with eating disorders based in body image concerns, that overvaluation of weight and shape in their control is a central component of the disorder. So it's like, yeah, of course that's a fear. That's, that's what's underlying this eating disorder. As well as we live in a society that has a lot of weight bias and fat phobia. And it's common that in our society, we hear people say things like this or hear people express fears around this. So we can, it's one of those that we can just kind of accept as like, okay, that's the fear. But gaining weight or getting fat isn't an inherently a threatening thing. It's not inherently a bad thing or a negative thing. It only, it's only like that for this patient because of the meaning that they've attached to getting fat or gaining weight. And that's what's causing that connection with anxiety and distress. Um, another thing that I want to point out about the getting fat comment that our patients will make is like, what does that mean? What does fat mean to them? Patients often use that as a shorthand for a lot of different things. It can even mean like negative emotional states when they're saying like, I feel fat today. So those are things that we really want to try to get to the bottom of um, when we're talking with patients. What does that mean to them? So we ask them, what does that mean to you? What, what do you think would happen if that were to happen? So patient number one, when we downward arrow that, presents with more of a traditional anorexic presentation. They're expressing, at least in my, from my understanding, internalized and externalized weight bias here. Um, they're afraid of their life falling apart. They're afraid of not having the things that they want in life because of their weight. Um, patient number three, this patient is transmasculine. They also have a di diagnosis of anorexia, but they express a different fear. They express that gaining weight to them means that they'll be perceived either by themselves or by others as more feminine, and that will lead to more dysphoria for them, and that would be completely intolerable. So again, very different underlying fears, and that, that's what's going to help guide us in how we want to approach treating these two patients. The third thing that I want to illustrate here is that not every fear or behavior is best addressed via exposure. It's great for some things. It's great when we're targeting fear, like true feared consequences, when it's targeting avoided behaviors. And there are some situations where it's not ideal. It's not really going to help us that much. For all patients in this example, we'll probably want to create an exposure hierarchy around eating the sandwich. It's not super functional to not be able to eat a sandwich in our culture. It's really easy 
if you're in a bind to find a sandwich shop or to find somewhere where you can get that food easily. And so it's something that it's, it's not really that functional to just not be able to eat that and have so much fear around it. So we're gonna wanna do those feared food exposures. However, we also want to under like we also really want to address those underlying concerns or fears as well. So when we think about the patient who's afraid of choking and dying, we also want to start maybe developing some imaginal exposures for them about what that what that would look like for them if they were to die. What would that look like in terms of missing out on your kids growing up? We also may want to develop um, exposures to address anything else that they're avoiding because of this fear. For patient number three, who is expressing that discomfort in their body due to this incongruency with their identity, we wouldn't want to do exposures around this. Um, there isn't any evidence to suggest that exposures in this context are, are beneficial or effective. Um, we might actually just want to see first if they would want to discuss exploring other medical options that could help address the dysphoria they're experiencing. Um, that so that they're not reliant only on trying to control their weight as a way of managing that. We would probably want to include components of self-compassion to help with that as well. Um, and then also maybe just providing some psychoed about trans and non-binary people and how um, there's a difference between gender identity and expression and how those don't necessarily have to match in stereotypical ways promoted by our society in order for them to be valid in their identity. Um, so we might have exercises of them looking at pictures or engaging with content online of trans and non-binary folks who are looking, who look all different ways um, and, and can show ways that challenge some of these internalized notions that they need to look a certain way. For patient number one, um, we might take a somewhat similar approach. So in addition to doing those food exposures, we probably also want to work on that internalization of the societal message that you have to look a certain way in order to be successful or happy or have the life you want. Um, so we might create ex exercises for that patient to look at, um, look at and engage with content um, of folks of all different body sizes, um, shapes, ability status, who counter that message um, and counter this belief that the patient has. Sometimes that can be an exposure in itself. So we might actually, that might actually be characterized as an exposure for some patients. And we also would wanna be working on some thought challenging as well. So quickly moving on to safety behaviors. Um, these are often what you're thinking about when you're thinking about typical behaviors associated with eating disorders. Um, one way to get at this can be to start by asking um, patients about the rules that they feel that they have to follow on a regular basis, rules that their eating disorder tells them they have to do. We have a worksheet that we give patients to complete. Um, it's probably helpful to do after you've like met them and had that first session and then give them that to do for homework. So you can have a chance to explain the, that worksheet to them. That's something that we'll also be sharing with you after this presentation, um, but it can be helpful. A lot of patients have these rules readily available um, and that, that can be really helpful piece in developing those exposures too. These are just a couple questions that I like to use to help identify safety behaviors with patients. In terms of this last one, I didn't kind of typoed that. This would be like, what are things that other people notice you doing that they've expressed concern about is maybe a way I would ask that. Things that they've stopped doing, things that they're doing to try to reduce their anxiety. The next, loose, the next few slides include common safety behaviors we often see in the eating disorder population. I've categorized these into larger themes that we often are targeting in exposure. Some of these can correspond to those other themes that we talked about with the feared cues. So like weight control behaviors, eating behaviors, um, body image, exercise or compensatory behaviors we'll also talk about in these slides, mental rituals or neutralizing. Um, and one that uh, I didn't list separately, but you'll see woven throughout all of these different themes um, in some of the examples here is just avoidance. Like avoidance is such a big one that we see our, from our patients. Um, you can conceptualize restriction as avoidance. Um, some of, and fasting, um, and we'll go through some of the others on the other slides. Um, one thing that people often have a question about is the over and under dressing in terms of weight control. Sometimes people will underdress so that they're shivering as a way to have more movement. 
to burn more calories. Other folks might overdress to try to overheat and sweat to burn more calories. In terms of the eating related behaviors, many of these eating re related behaviors serve a function of preventing loss of control over eating. Not all of them, and actually a lot of these might have multiple functions, um, but preventing that loss of control is really a common theme that we see with, with some of the idiosyncratic behaviors folks have. Some of these also um, could be interpreted as a, um, just a behavioral symptom of starvation. Uh, the starvation literature is really interesting. It's kind of beyond what we have time to discuss right now, but that's something that's really interesting to look into is just how does the body naturally respond when it's weight suppressed? And some of these things are behaviors we see from that. Um, body image re related behaviors, it's really common for folks to be checking or engaging in other behaviors like that. Um, I like to start with open-ended questions when trying to figure out some of these behaviors, like what are some ways that you find yourself checking your body shape or weight or gaining reassurance about your body shape and weight? Um, we want to make sure to consider that these might look different for folks in different bodies. Um, often I think the questions that we tend to go to first um, are really oriented around folks who are underweight. And so just just think about that more broadly of things that might apply to different body shapes or sizes. Exercise related behaviors can be really tricky. Um, sometimes patients are really forthcoming. They're like, yeah, over exercise is a thing. It comes out really easily in the assessment. For others, they may, it, it may not look like traditional exercise. And so um, a pro tip here is keeping in mind the total, the sum total of all movement throughout the day. So a patient might deny over exercising, but then later you learn, hey, this person's in a service industry job where they're waiting tables and running around for an eight hour shift every day. Then they come home and they do a 30 to 60 minute exercise. And then while they're at home, they're constantly staying busy. They're constantly doing chores and moving around. And pretty quickly when we add all that up, that's like 12 hours a day of movement. Um, and so some of that is, can be helpful to really dig into deeper with patients to identify, like, are there any things that maybe they're not conceptualizing as exercise or, or over exercise that really are going to prevent them from being able to maintain a stable weight? Um, they might, it might be interfering with weight restoration when you're working on that with them. Um, just a couple things to look out for. And also neutralizing thoughts or mental rituals. We see that in eating disorders as well as anxiety. So just to be on the lookout for that, um, I've often had patients say like, well, I'll never eat this after treatment. So it's not that hard for me to eat it here or having thoughts in their head of like, well, I'm just gonna lose weight when I leave treatment anyways. Um, some of those things just helpful to have in, your, in the back of your mind to check in with patients if that's happening for them. All right, functional assessment really want to identify the function, um, asking questions like, what would happen if you didn't do X, Y, Z? Um, have you, um, I think that's really the primary one that I tend to lean towards. How, how is that serving you? What does that do for you by, by engaging in that safety behavior? Um, and just being aware that some of those behaviors might serve a couple different purposes for patients. And we'll skip through this. So eating disorder exposures. Um, we're gonna create that hierarchy. You can step up the hierarchy if you want to step by step. Um, the field is moving more towards an inhibitory learning approach with exposure therapy where we might allow some space for jumping around the exposure hierarchy. The only caveat to that is we want to make sure that patients are able to manage resisting the safety behaviors. Um, and so that's usually how I determine if a patient's really ready to jump up to that six or that seven is, are they really able to resist that urge to engage in the safety behavior? And if not, then it's probably better to start lower on the hierarchy. So this is just a quick review of the basics of inhibitory learning. Um, I'm going to skip through that for the sake of time. Um, but just a quick reminder on that piece. So um, I'm going to use this patient, Debbie, as an example. Um, 
you can read read through this on your own. The things that I want to highlight here are the, the pieces that Debbie's experiencing significant distress related to. And we'll use this to um, show some of the exposures that we might do. So for Debbie, the things that are contributing most to their distress are feelings of fullness, tightness, and bloating. That's leading to increased urges to purge for them. They're also experiencing distress related to body image. So we're seeing some body image avoidance from them. They're avoiding mirrors, avoiding clothing that brings attention to their body. Um, they also have distress around weight gain and the fear that their weight is gonna increase indefinitely if they give up any of their weight control behaviors. And you can see several of those behaviors listed out here. They also have distress over feeling out of control related to binging and feeling unable to trust themselves around certain foods. So maybe they keep those foods out of the house. Um, they don't even allow themselves to go to that aisle on the grocery store, unless maybe they're planning for a binge. So right off the bat, what we're gonna do, we're gonna start with normalized or structured eating. So that's eating three meals a day and about two to three snacks per day. The main goal here, we don't want someone going longer than about four hours without food intake. Um, as soon as we can, we're also going to start with collaborative weighing or open weighing once a week in, in session with the therapist. Um, that's going to help with working on the fears, um, the, like the reducing the safety behavior of weighing every single day or multiple times repeatedly that Debbie is experiencing. Um, the normalized eating also can be ex conceptualized as an exposure for Debbie, given the use of that intermittent fasting or restriction that they're they're using to try to control weight. So we're going to try to take that away and work with them on normalized eating. That's going to be likely um, pretty anxiety provoking for them. If you want more information on those components of treatment, the best resources I found are Chris Fairburn's CBT for Eating Disorders Manual. That's, um, I'm going to show you, I have it right here. That is this red manual. Um, the other one that I find really helpful for these components and kind of the basics is Glenn Waller's CBT for Eating Disorders, a comprehensive guide. Um, those will go into more de detail about how to do that. Also from the start, we're gonna work on reducing safety behaviors. We wanna prioritize the behaviors that are causing the most risk. So in Debbie's case, this would be laxative use and purging. Following, um, following that, we also wanna be targeting Re reducing the use of any behaviors that are going to significantly interfere with our treatment components. Um, and that's how we kind of prioritize. So safety, things that are interfering with treatment, and then everything else that they're using for safety behaviors. So the behaviors that are likely going to interfere with treatment are like calorie tracking, frequent weighing, reading labels. Those are going to run directly counter to what we're asking them to do in treatment. Then we want to incorporate exposures around fullness or bloating. So for Debbie, this is one of the main main triggers for binging for them. So we really want to hit this early on. Um, we would do for this, we want to use interoceptive exposures. So we can use those exposures outside of meal time. So we can take off that anxiety around weight gain. And we can focus really on helping them to get used to these physical sensations in their body that they find really uncomfortable, like bloating or fullness. Um, I have a slide in here that talks about a variety of different exercises that we commonly use for interoceptives that you can reference later. Some things that we might do is like having them drink a whole can of carbonated soda um, really quickly. And then that tends with the bubbles expanding to really simulate some of those feelings. We might pair that with wearing some tight clothing around the stomach. Um, and then ultimately, once they're kind of adjusted to that and acclimated to that, we might pair that with other exposures, like doing an interoceptive exposure before doing a mirror exposure. That we would probably wait till later on in treatment, but just to give you a sense of where we're headed in combining some of these exposures together. We also wanna tackle some, some binge cue exposures um, and probably some purge cue exposures as well. It's a really important when you're doing those binge cue or purge cue exposures that you wait until after the patient has established a, no a pattern of normalized eating and their bodies become adjusted to that. Um, and that's because when someone's restricting, there's biological mechanisms that are gonna increase the binge urges. So if we can get that normalized eating pattern going for them, we can usually naturally decrease some of the intensity of those urges. So we're not fighting biology, we're just working with what's left. 
So we'll usually start those a little bit later. Um, then we wanna incorporate body image exposures as well. So um, this is where mirror exposure comes in. There's a lot of really great resources out there on mirror exposure that I would be happy to share with you um, later if you would like. We're not gonna get into all of the details of mirror exposure here because there are um, pretty readily available resources out there that can explain how to go through that. Um, for some patients, mirror exposure is really, really scary. It's like a 10 out of 10 for them in terms of the fear hierarchy. So in order to help them get to that point, we might start with other body image exposures first. So um, maybe having them sit in positions that they perceive as unflattering or that bring more attention to their body we might have them work on wearing tight fitting clothing um, without looking at themselves. So just feeling the sensation of tightness on their body, um, things like that, that we might start off with. And then we can move to mirror exposure next. Um, all right. So these next slides just go into a little bit more detail about some of these things. I'll leave these here for you as, as just a reference for later. Um, let me see. The last thing that we're going to talk about are common, some common pitfalls um, in exposure therapy for eating disorders. These are relatively common mistakes that all of us have made at some point in time. Um, I think there are just things to be aware of as you're starting to incorporate exposure therapy for eating disorders into your practice. Um, I'm going to focus on a couple of these in particular. So mistaking forced contact with exposure is a really big one. So all of our patients, if we're starting them on normalized eating plan, they're going to be eating up to six times a day. And probably most of those times are going to be pretty anxiety provoking. It might just, even if they're eating a safe food, just the act of eating might be really anxiety provoking for them. And so it can be easy, I think, for us to just be like, oh, well, they're doing exposure six times a day. They're, we're doing exposure therapy. And what we know from the literature is that having forced contact with a feared stimuli is different in terms of the effectiveness of that than doing an intentional exposure where you're intentionally facing that fear and testing out a feared consequence. Um, and that's what we really are looking for with exposure. Sometimes with like forced contact, people end up just kind of like white knuckling it and just kind of getting through it maybe using some safety behaviors to help them get through it, that's not gonna give, get us the same results in treatment. So we really want that intentional fear, um, facing of the fear. This often comes up to like thinking about residential programs or other programs where there might be like just a set meal that they have to eat. That we, we want them, even if it's not in that situation, we want to be incorporating some intentional food exposures for that patient, where they're the ones choosing the food that they're going to challenge. Um, and we can work through that feared consequence, feared outcome, what actually happened um, process with them on that. Another thing that I want to highlight on this slide is therapist's own anxiety about exposure. Um, we all got into this field because we care about patients. We want to help people. And for a lot of us, it's pretty distressing to see our patients in distress. And that can be hard as a therapist. And so I think it can sometimes lead us to take a more cautious approach, which then makes exposure less effective for our patients. So we might not implement that overcorrection model because we notice our patients distress and we don't really wanna push them too hard. Um, we also might procrastinate starting exposure. Maybe the patient's like, well, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. And pretty soon we're several months into treatment and we haven't started any exposures yet. Um, which can help give patients that boost, especially with certain fears, um, to help them progress a little bit more quickly in treatment. So those are some things to look out for, um, is just being mindful of your own anxiety and how that might impact how you're approaching therapy, getting consultation if you need it, or if you're feeling stuck, or if that's coming up for you, something really often that I'll talk about with the providers that I supervise around their own emotions that might be coming up with exposure therapy. Um, some things that our anxiety might also do is like lead us to avoid collaborative weight. One, because it's really hard for the patient, but it's also one of the harder, at least in my opinion, one of the harder things that we do as therapists. Um, and so seeing what extra training you might need or extra support you might need 
to feel a little bit more confident and being able to do that with patients is going to be helpful and helping you overcome some of that anxiety if you feel that. I know I did when I first started out with this. Um, the rest of these I'll leave for you to kind of read on your own. I think we've covered some of these already just in talking about other things. Um, and the last two, this first one is um, particularly true for feared consequences that have a high probability of occurring. So I think often we can get into a trap, um, especially when we're thinking about inhibitory learning, we're thinking of like challenging this expectancy of like the likelihood of an event happening. And that's usually, that usually makes sense in anxiety because oftentimes the feared consequence isn't maybe that likely to happen. So that's something that we're helping someone learn. With eating disorders, it's not uncommon that the feared consequence is actually maybe something that is likely to happen. So we have a patient who needs to restore weight um, and they're really afraid of weight gain. Focusing on expectancy violation isn't probably gonna be as helpful for us because they are gonna gain weight. And so we wanna shift our focus to maybe increase tolerance of distress around that. So maybe challenging their expectation that like under no circumstances could I tolerate this weight gain. Um, that's something that we can challenge in these exposures. Also, we can learn more about the fear. So instead of um, just leaving it at, I fear gaining weight, is there anything else about that? Is it, I fear that I'm gonna gain weight at such a rapid pace that that's gonna be, un, it's gonna be unreal. I can't, I'm not gonna be able to handle that. We can target that expectancy of rate of increase of weight. We could also, um, some patients say like, I'm gonna, my weight's gonna increase indefinitely and it's never gonna stop. That's something that we can challenge um, within that. So just being mindful of some of those pieces that are that are different with eating disorders than with some of our more common approaches to anxiety. And the last thing that I want to mention is um, just thinking, try to think about exposures that you're assigning from a justice-informed lens. This is kind of a new discussion in the field. Um, it's it's really it's a really important one that we're having. Um, and just thinking about like is the exposure that we're developing for this patient really necessary? Is that necessary to help challenge the fear? And are there any ways that this exposure might unintentionally um, reinforce some harmful stereotype or further marginalize a population? Um, this is, there's a really cool article that came out by Pensiati et al. The reference is down here. It's also gonna be in the references section. This is focused on like sexual orientation OCD and exposures related to that. But I think, I think some of the core pieces that they talk about in that article are relevant across the exposures we're doing across different anxiety disorders, eating disorders, trauma. Um, and so it can be helpful to just think about things from that lens. Um, we don't necessarily always have to push things to the full extreme. Um, some examples that I think about um, that I think come up in our population is thinking about the harmful stereotype that our patients will often bring into session of, if I gain weight, people are going to think that I'm lazy or they're gonna judge me negatively. So if we're gonna target that in exposure, one way that we, we wouldn't wanna go down is to have them watch videos where that is being promoted or that's being confirmed. Um, we wouldn't want them to watch or engage in content like that, that reinforces that harmful stereotype. Instead, we can just go down to the core fear of you're afraid of other people judging you for being lazy. Let's do some exposures around that. Let's have you sit around um, on the unit while other people are working on their work and not do anything or sit there and do something that you feel is really unproductive. And so there's ways that we can target that that don't, that don't even touch or reinforce any of those things that they're bringing into our sessions. Um, our patients often are bringing in these like hyper-focused messages from society that I think is important to be mindful of. Um, before I hand this off to Dr. Smith, I just want to mention one last thing. Um, if you're looking for a really good comprehensive resource for exposure therapy for eating disorders, there was a manual that was just published a couple years ago. I can show you right here. Um, it's exposure therapy for eating disorders. Uh, it's part of the ABCT series. Um, this is by Becker, Farrell, and Waller, and they go into so much detail about most of the things that we've talked about here today, um, and it's just like a really great reference to have on hand.
And with that, I'll turn this over to Dr. Smith. Perfect start with my chair malfunction. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Um, really great overview and, and digging deeper into the exposure work that we do here. And as we get started, again, I'm Brad Smith, um, and I, my preferred pronouns are he, him, his. Um, as Dr. Hill was concluding, I was thinking about the teamwork that's necessary and really important as a part of the treatment for individuals with eating disorders, um, because none of this is really done or possible in a vacuum, uh, whether it's the therapy standpoint, um, in particular the exposure work, or if it's the medication strategies, um, but it really is a team approach that we try to take. And um, my section now will be talking about the, the teamwork as it relates to the psychiatric interventions that we use and medication strategies. And in particular, in the context of exposure therapy, um, but first to understand how that, that works in the world of exposure therapy, uh, we need to just know some of the medications that are used for individuals with eating disorders. So I'll cover that briefly. And uh, you'll see here first that it's a short list of medications that actually have FDA approval for the symptoms and behaviors of eating disorders or, or eating disorder diagnoses in particular. So we just have fluoxetine for bulimia nervosa and we have list dexamphetamine or Vyvanse for binge eating disorder. So what that tells us is that uh, we only have a few choices if we're going to be very pure about sticking to FDA approved medications for that specific diagnosis. And I'm sure you've all seen that many individuals with eating disorders are prescribed a whole array of medications. So clearly uh, our psychiatry field is, is going off label with a lot of medications to treat the underlying symptoms and behaviors of the eating disorder. And as we'll share or get into, uh, a lot of that is guided by their other co-occurring issues, their other co-occurring diagnoses. Uh, but let's start first with the next slide. We'll look a little bit diagnosis by diagnosis in the eating disorder realm of what the medications are that we have available uh, to consider at least. And again, for anorexia nervosa, there are none that are FDA approved. And as you see a brief list here, um, of the medications that we commonly see used, tried or tried for anorexia nervosa, one things that one of the things that stands out to me is that many of these medications or classes of medications have weight gain as a side effect, and that is actually what led to them being tried or studied for the treatment of anorexia nervosa, and um, that makes some common sense. Uh, but for those of us who've worked with individuals with eating disorders, you know that there's a practical side to that, that even if there is a good medication that might help with weight gain or weight restoration, uh, it's very difficult to get somebody on board with doing that uh, because of the control issues underlying the eating disorder and the thoughts behind uh, the, the process of weight restoration. And it's certainly uh, in knowing how these medications create weight gain, it's not my goal, certainly, to utilize those side effects as a way for people to restore weight uh, because it's happening through a mechanism that we don't really want. So we try to share that with our individuals who do try some of these medications that what we're really trying to do is help them with the actual symptoms, anxiety, the mood issues that underlie their eating disorder as a way to help them get the nutritional rehabilitation and help them move forward with what they need to do with the meal plan and if we see signs of a side effect happening from the medication as it relates to their metabolic profile or their weight restoration happening faster than we're intending, we actually wanna make a change in that. We're not, we're not aiming for that, but I wanted to give that overview that many of the medicines you see on this list were tried initially because they have weight gain as a side effect. So next slide, please. Let's look first at the antipsychotics as a class. Um, one of the areas that's a great resource for information related to medications for eating disorders is from a 2011 uh, systematic review of all studies done by the World Federation of Societies of Biological Psychiatry. So it looked at you know, 33 years of, of studies in regards to various medications, and it came away with recommendations as it relates to antipsychotics that uh, 
separated out olanzapine as having a little better evidence in the literature for possible consideration for the symptoms and behaviors of anorexia nervosa. So grade B evidence in this review meant uh, there was limited positive evidence from controlled studies, but does not have an FDA uh, approval though. Other second generation antipsychotics received a grade C because the evidence primarily consisted of uncontrolled studies or case reports, expert opinions. Next slide. Now, since olanzapine was identified as having a better grade from this review and because we commonly see olanzapine being tried for individuals with anorexia nervosa, it makes sense to look a little bit deeper into the olanzapine uh, studies. So back in 2007, we see um, a literature search for all studies related to olanzapine, uh, it primarily involved case reports and clinical trials, but there was preliminary evidence to support that it may help with weight restoration and with the psychological symptoms. So starting to look kind of promising. 2008, we have more of a controlled trial with a double blind placebo controlled trial, rather small N, but starting to show that there may be some faster weight restoration and improvement in the obsessional thinking. So starting to look promising. In 2011, uh, there's another double blind placebo controlled trial a small N, but did not show a big difference in weight restoration. And unfortunately, some of these metabolic side effects started to show up in the olanzapine group. And so the, you know, the desire to use olanzapine is offset now by some of these metabolic side effects showing up. 2019, another double blind placebo controlled trial with a little bit higher N. And it looks like olanzapine improved weight restoration, but no clear improvement in obsessions. So we have a growing trend in the literature showing that there may be some efficacy from olanzapine. And it's not clear if it's from just the weight restoration piece or if there is some improvement in the obsessions. But clearly when prescribing uh, olanzapine or other antipsychotics, that is one of the hopes is that they're helping with some of the obsessional thinking. Next slide. We'll move on to another commonly tried medication, which is mirtazapine. It's an antidepressant medication, and it's mainly tried because it has a favorable side effect profile as it relates to individuals with eating disorders. Compared to other antidepressants, it tends to help GI symptoms, or at least not exacerbate GI symptoms the way other antidepressants do. It tends to help with sleep in a way that other antidepressants don't. And it tends to work pretty quickly on anxiety features the way other antidepressants don't. So there's good reason why it's tried often for individuals with anorexia nervosa, but there are no clear randomized controlled trials supporting it. There are case reports, retrospective studies, uh, widely attempted because of this favorable profile. Next slide. Another medication that's been popular in the use uh, or in the treatment of individuals with anorexia is cyproheptadine, which is, um, which is an antihistamine medication. And a review in 2019 um, saw that the reason it was tried for individuals with anorexia primarily stems from literature among children with asthma who had increased appetite when using this medicine. But a couple of randomized controlled trials did not demonstrate efficacy in anorexia nervosa. And more importantly, it seemed to worsen the binge purge behaviors. So cautionary tale as it relates to cyproheptadine. Next slide. Cannabinoids, uh, clearly they're, they're tried because they can stimulate appetite. A more systematic review on this in 2019 showed that there was possible quicker weight restoration in one of the studies, but the side effects of dysphoria and the limited evidence precludes a standard use for it at this time. Next is zinc, uh, which, came, which comes out of this uh, task force on eating disorders um, back in 2011 with grade B evidence. So randomized controlled trials backing it up. Uh, one of which is this review of the literature in 2002 showing that there is evidence for zinc improving weight restoration, possibly mood and anxiety and primarily because it has low chance of side effects or low toxicity, um, there's probably a lower threshold 
necessary for considering zinc in treatment for individuals with anorexia nervosa. And to summarize, we don't have we don't have an FDA approved medication for anorexia nervosa, um, but we do have some indication in the literature of some medications that may be worth trying uh, when we're looking at specific symptoms and behaviors, but there's, there's not enough here to recommend this as a first-line choice for our individuals with anorexia nervosa. Next, for bulimia, there is one FDA-approved medication, and that's fluoxetine, so we'll cover that in a little bit more detail, and then we'll go over the other medications more quickly, but because they're all off-label. Next slide. With fluoxetine, of course, is FDA approved. Um, this same study in 2011 from the World Federation gave it a grade A, the highest recommendation because it is uh, FDA approved. It has numerous randomized controlled trials showing efficacy and no major cautions added to that grade A recommendation because the side effect profile is pretty, pretty favorable. One important note that you'll see in the patients that you have is that um, the target dose is 60 milligrams based on these studies, and that's a little higher dose than what you might need for more straightforward depression, um, but mirrors more of the dose range that we usually need to get to for good effects for anxiety or OCD. But in these studies, bulimia was affected mostly at 60 milligrams and above. Next slide. Tricyclic antidepressants are the category of medications that predominated the field before the advent of SSRIs. So there's a long history of trying uh, various tricyclics to see if they would work for bulimia. And there are a number of randomized controlled trials supporting them. Um, and in fact, this World Federation gave it a grade A recommendation, but with caution. The caution meaning that there are significant side effect issues that need to be considered. So what we know about tricyclic antidepressants over the many years that they've been around is that they have a side effect profile that's pretty challenging even for people without eating disorders. But then the side effect profile is more challenging and unfortunately more dangerous for individuals with bulimia. Uh, and this relates to some of the possible side effects of uh, QT prolongation, so interference with some of the electrical conductivity of the heart, heart block, arrhythmias, and then GI side effects with constipation, and then effects on orthostasis or blood pressure changes and pulse changes, um, leading to this being a, a very difficult medication to use in individuals who have bulimia. Next slide. Since fluoxetine does have an FDA approval for bulimia, we expect that most other SSRIs and maybe most other antidepressants could have some efficacy also. They have not reached a level of being FDA approved, but as you see here, a number of them have some randomized controlled trials. A couple of notes here. Phenylzine is probably a less familiar medication. It's a monoamine oxidase inhibitor or MAOI, not used as commonly in 2022 as it may have been a few decades ago but there are trials showing its efficacy. But again, because of the side effect profile being less favorable and more difficult to work with, it's not typically used for individuals with bulimia. Bupropion is also an antidepressant that deserves caution and a, and a note here. Um, there is a one trial showing efficacy, but in that same trial, there is a high incidence of seizures leading to the uh, relative contraindication for individuals with eating disorders. So we really try to avoid bupropion for individuals uh, who have eating disorders. Next slide. Topiramate has been used off-label. Uh, topiramate is Topamax. And this same uh, World Federation study gave it a grade A recommendation because of a number of randomized controlled trials. Um, one note here is that in the 2003 review, um, it, the median dose was 100 milligrams. And what's important about this is that when topiramate is used for seizures, which is its original indication, uh, it's used usually at 200 milligrams or higher. And when this started to be tried for individuals with bulimia, the dose was pushed to those levels and there are significant side effect disadvantages to being at those higher doses. 
And so if the dose can be in the lower range, around 100 or 150 milligrams, the side effect profile is a lot better tolerated. And we generally see good results at these low dosages. So we don't need to go to those high dosages, creating the unfavorable side effect profile. Next, naltrexone. Naltrexone is a medication that's FDA approved for alcohol use disorders and opioid use disorders. So our colleagues in the addiction field and substance use field use this very commonly. Uh, they also commonly use it off-label for other forms of addictions. And um, it's been used or tried for individuals who have any behavior that may be thought of as addicting or may be thought of as a repetitive, difficult to avoid or difficult to stop behavior. So it was no surprise that early on with the studies in naltrexone, they tried this for individuals with eating disorders and bulimia in particular. A couple of early studies with very small N uh, showed that it may have efficacy, but the efficacy occurred at high dosages. So um, it's important to note that the dosage range for naltrexone when using it for substance use disorders is around 50 milligrams. And for these studies, they were using it from about 150 to all the way up to 300 milligrams. Next slide. So um, binge eating disorder is uh, the other category where we have an FDA approved medication, which is Lisdexamphetamine or Vyvanse. And then some off-label uses again of topiramate, antidepressants and naltrexone. Next slide. Um, that's a busy slide. The main point I would like to take away from this is that uh, the ends in these studies. So we see the difference between a lot of these other studies for medications that are being used off label having an N of 10, 20, 30. For FDA approval, here's more of what we see ends of 200, 300, 50. Um, so very high ends. And um, 50 to 70 milligrams is a dose range that seems to work. And somewhat surprisingly, the, the side effect profile or um, trouble with the medication is a lot less than most people expect. We get used to being very cautious with stimulants, which is good, but for individuals with binge eating disorder, it seems that the um, comparison of number needed to treat for a good response versus the number needed to treat before there's any harm is a very favorable uh, profile. So in this population, it looked very favorable. Next slide. Topiramate, which is commonly used and gets that grade A recommendation for bulimia, also gets it for binge eating disorder because the primary interference seems to be in the urges to uh, binge. And there are three randomized controlled trials. And then another uh, systemic or systematic review in 2017 points out that, again, the topiramate has side effects, especially at the high dosages. And so it has high discontinuation rates based on those side effects. Next slide. As a family or class of medications, we expect antidepressants may have some efficacy here for individuals with binge eating disorder. And part of that is our understanding of how emotional um, challenges, distress, anxiety tend to be some of the antecedents to binge behaviors. And so we would anticipate that if somebody has some help with their mood and anxiety, that they could have uh, fewer episodes of binging or less uh, severe forms of binging. So a number of randomized controlled trials across the board here with antidepressants. Um, and so we expect that we're going to see individuals on antidepressants if they have binge eating disorder, even though the only FDA approved medication is for Vyvanse. Next. Now Trexone shows up again as, a, as one to try for binge eating disorder, at least based on limited data in the literature. Um, so there is efficacy in at least one randomized controlled trial. Um, it's also combined with bupropion for a weight loss medication. And so this is another reason why it's commonly tried for individuals with binge eating disorder, even though it hasn't been established with, uh, with FDA approval. Next slide. And I'll mention uh, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder or ARFID. Um, there's very little consensus in the literature on the treatment approaches 
in general, and that includes medication. So um, we have two very small studies, retrospective chart reviews, one suggesting olanzapine, one suggesting mirtazapine. But what we really see in practice and what we see in the literature is that people tend to go back to the medications that have been tried for anorexia nervosa or any sort of restrictive patterns of eating and then try those medications. Or what we'll move on to soon is how it usually depends on what the co-occurring diagnosis is will determine whether medication is utilized for individuals with ARFID. Next slide. As Dr. Hill mentioned earlier, um, it is the norm for individuals with eating disorders to have another co-occurring psychiatric diagnosis. And these are the most common ones. So consequently, next slide, we are going to see individuals coming into our practice with uh, the whole array of medications that are used in psychiatry. But in particular, we expect that individuals will be on, are commonly on SSRIs, SNRIs, um, other antidepressants, and to some extent antipsychotics. But just indicating that we have FDA approval for these other co-occurring diagnoses. So in the way that psychiatrists tend to approach the treatment of individuals with eating disorders is that there are only a couple of medications that have FDA approval. We know that there are these off-label uh, possibilities for treatment of individuals with eating disorders, but what probably guides the treatment approach even more is what are the co-occurring diagnoses because we do have more laser-focused medications with FDA approval to address their co-occurring issues. And in turn, we anticipate that may help their eating disorder symptoms and behaviors, or at the very least, that may be the safest or best balance of risk and benefit to start with addressing the co-occurring issues, since almost all of those medications have at least some limited information in the literature of trying them in certain diagnoses. The important part is to know which ones to avoid. And we've talked a little bit about a few of those, but that's where the, it gets tricky because there are some medications that are important to try to avoid in certain eating disorders. Um, and everything that we, I've talked about in terms of the medication approaches up until this slide has been about how we might address a treatment plan over the longer term. So what are the medication options for longer term treatment and recovery from a person's eating disorder, from their depression, their anxiety or OCD. All of these medication strategies are thought to be long-term or preventative in a way. What I'll talk about now is what we're faced with in our clinical practice, especially in more acute settings, where we also look at medications as a way to try to help with acute symptom management. And most importantly, in our settings for eating disorder treatment, that involves acute treatment of anxiety. So the medications we commonly use for this are the same medications we might use if somebody were in an anxiety center or an OCD center, um, but the common ways to bring down anxiety very quickly, benzodiazepines, antihistamines, gabapentin or pregabalin, and antipsychotics. And again, noting which ones are off label. Next slide. And then just as we have co-occurring psychiatric diagnoses or issues, it's important to note that it will be common for individuals coming into our practice to have a wide array oftentimes of physical health or physical medications that they're using because the eating disorder symptoms and behaviors themselves can lead to medical consequences as we all know. But what's also important to know is that the treatment process can involve physical consequences or changes that have to occur in the body that lead to distress. So gastroparesis or slowing down of the GI motility, common in individuals with restrictive patterns, somewhat common in individuals who have purging patterns. Constipation is common across almost all restrictive or purging uh, behaviors. A gastroesophageal reflux disease is very common. And then other GI problems uh, such as nausea or fullness, uh, so a wide array of medications that you'll see people on to try to address those co-occurring medical issues. And then some of them even 
occurring because of the treatment that we're providing. So as we get people into more of a nutritional stabilization, they're, they may have more trouble with their constipation or they may have more fullness and nausea. They may develop edema because they're making the positive changes of stopping their purging behaviors. So we will be addressing those in the treatment setting, trying to make sure that not only through psychiatric medications, but also through our physical health medications, that we're making it manageable for people to do the things that they need to do. First of all, in the nutritional stability, to be able to eat, to be able to drink fluids, and then also to be able to do the cognitive behavior therapy work and the exposure work. We need them to be able to make progress and for it to be manageable. And sometimes these medications, both psychiatric and medical medications can help us get to a point where it's manageable. Next slide. And that's where we'll spend the rest of the time uh, briefly talking about how to use these medications in exposure therapy, the good and the bad. We'll start with what's proposed to be some of the ways it can assist. Now, D-cycloserin is a medication most commonly used for the treatment of tuberculosis, um, which is not a very common uh, need, at least in our country. Um, but it has a property of having uh, a receptor modulation at the NMDA receptor. And this allows it to augment glutamatergic function and increases the efficiency of extinction. Um, and so you see this commonly in the exposure literature. Uh, we don't see it commonly in clinical practice, but I wanted to mention it here because it is commonly in the literature. But um, the, the take home on this is that in studies, it seems to be able to increase the speed and efficiency of improvement, but the effects seem to decrease over time. Next slide. And we'll go to the next slide. So the ways that antidepressants may help exposure work. Um, I, you see the graph here on the rise and fall of anxiety that we expect when people are exposed to anxiety producing situations. And antidepressants by way of reducing anxiety based on their FDA approval uh, can assist with bringing down the global anxiety to make exposure work possible for people who are extremely anxious and just can't get started otherwise. There are also people who end up with significant improvement of their depression who then can start the exposure work. And maybe their depression was interfering through the learning process. Maybe it was interfering with even having the motivation or energy to do it, but the antidepressant ends up being helpful. It also can reduce, antidepressants also reduce OCD symptoms in the same fashion to allow them to do the actual exposure work. Next slide. Now, what's a little more controversial is the anxiety reducing medications for reducing anxiety in the moment, not like antidepressants where you're just bringing down global anxiety over time, but this is reducing the anxiety in the next half hour to maybe a couple hours after that, where we're looking at benzodiazepines, gabapentin, antihistamines, or antipsychotics as the most common ways of doing that. And what you see from the highlighted graph part, part here is that delivering a medication may bring down that anxiety curve to where it's manageable for someone. And this we might use if we haven't been able to find a way to get an exposure to be broken down to a way that it could be manageable, or if it's something we really need the person to do and the only way we've been able to get them to try it is with a medication as a first step. Next slide. Now there is caution with this because uh, we can create a problem with using medications with the exposure work also. Next slide. One of these problems is by inhibition of learning and memory, which is a global effect of almost any medication that, um, that works on anxiety, but mostly related to the benzodiazepines where we have some impairment of learning and memory. Um, there also could be an interference with the natural rise and fall of anxiety during the exposure work, so it doesn't allow a person to experience the full benefit. And finally, it could become a safety behavior or a state-dependent learning process. Next slide. Um, this, the red line in this graph shows that if we reduce the anxiety acutely, like after somebody has been exposed to something, we're not allowing them to have that natural, slow progression of the anxiety improving over time for them to get the habituation. And we also might, if we deliver it even earlier, we might not even allow the rise to happen in the anxiety so that all the person learns during the exposure is that 
boy, that Xanax worked really well. Um, because if we give them some sort of anxiety reducing medication and then they don't experience any rise or fall of the anxiety, all that they've taken away from that, either consciously or even subconsciously, is that the medication that we paired with it is what did the trick. Next. And so this medication as a safety behavior is a legitimate concern in how we use medications and exposure work. And um, the anxiety reducing medications, most importantly, because they can be seen as a safety behavior, they get paired with it in a close proximity. So it's natural for it to, to become a safety behavior if we don't work to remove that medication once the person gets some traction going with their exposure work. Antidepressants are not as likely to become a safety behavior because they're not paired in any sort of proximity to the actual exposure. They're just a background medication that someone is taking for a long-term effect. Next slide. There are a couple of studies here I just mentioned regarding benzodiazepines um, with the take-home message that it's important to have a lot of caution with using acute reduction of anxiety in the midst of, of exposure work. And that said, the literature seems to support that if people are having extreme difficulty getting started because of high levels of anxiety, panic attack at every type of exposure that we can come up with, it may be, it may be helpful, at least in the initial stages, to try this. But this is in a good teamwork situation where we're working together and I'm working with Dr. Hill and the rest of our expert team about uh, with individuals who are experts themselves at delivering exposure therapy. And if we haven't been able to come up with a way to break down their exposure therapy to allow it to be manageable, this may be one of the steps that helps us get started. Next slide. And one more. So I'll wrap up briefly with, a, with a, just a case example. 24-year-old African-American transgender female with anorexia nervosa restricting type and OCD. Panic attacks happening at every meal and some snacks. The restriction is based on the underlying body image issues as well as contamination fears, only taking in a few hundred calories per day. Current medications, fluoxetine at 10 milligrams, estradiol and spironolactone. And so from a medication standpoint, thinking about what are the options for this individual. And I just wanted to point out that even though the person is already on some medication, where I'm actually looking first is to try to help the person get nutrition stabilized because if they're only taking in a few hundred calories per day, I'm expecting they're gonna be pretty, pretty malnourished. They're likely to have some weight suppression. They're likely to not be able to benefit from the medication, at least the, the psychiatric medication that they're taking. They're likely not able to do the therapy work very effectively and they need the nutrition stabilized acutely. So this would be an example of where we would likely employ some of those techniques with short acting or reducing the anxiety before meals and snacks to just help the person get going with stable nutrition with the idea of trying to remove that medication approach as the therapy gets going, as they get more capable to manage the meal plan. And then the fluoxetine is certainly open to being increased later, but we need that stable nutrition first. Um, and we also need to pay attention to the other medications that someone is on from their more medical side to see if that's causing or creating any challenges or needs adjusting to help treat their OCD or anxiety as well. Next slide, please. So thank you everyone. My section is concluded and I think that Annie's going to take the ball for uh, questions and answers. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Smith and Dr. Hill. Now it's time to answer questions. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button, not the chat feature on the Zoom taskbar. We will try to get to as many questions as we can uh, with the time that we have left. If we do not get to your question, please send me an email message afterwards and I will follow up with you. Um, the first question that we have is, you mentioned the inhib inhibitory learning approach. What is that exactly? I'd be happy to answer that one. Um, so I think the easiest way to uh, describe that is to kind of say what it isn't. So this is compared to the habituation model of exposure. So when exposure first came out, 
um, really everyone focused on habituation or extinction as a thing that was making exposure work with anxiety. And more recently, probably in the last 10 years or so, um, there's been more discussion that actually that might not be the whole story. So maybe there's some piece of that habituation that's a piece of ex why exposure works, but also um, there's this inhibitory learning, which basically means new learning that's occurring. So corrective learning that's happening um, versus just like extinguishing the old learning. And so what we're trying to do in exposure through that inhibitory learning model is really maximize the learning of this new association of um, stimulus and no harm or stimulus, no threat. So there's a couple ways that we can do that. Um, Krask, uh, Michelle Krask is the person who's really leaded or led this discussion there. You can find a lot of information online about inhibitory learning if you're curious about it. But a few things that are um, talked about in the field are um, repeating trials, really varying the context and the stimuli to try to increase generalization of that new learning combining different fear cues together. Um, so that was something that I, I think I touched on a lot during my part of the presentation and really trying to maximize the thing that we're finding leads to the best learning is maximizing what we call expectancy violation. So as a patient, I expect that when I do this, this really feared conse consequence is gonna happen. And so we wanna maximize the difference between that thing that I'm expecting and what actually happens in that experience and that tends to lead to the, mo the, the biggest kind of learning curve and for that learning to be sustained long-term. So if I think this dog is gonna bite me when I, and it's gonna, I'm gonna end up in the hospital, it's gonna be this horrific thing. And I actually engage with that dog and maybe I even like kind of like play with it and try to pounce on it. And instead it kind of licks me and we are playing and it's really a happy, like it's a happy dog, it's fine that is going to be more powerful than if I just kind of timidly go up to the dog, there's still a fence, and I kind of go up and see if it's going to get upset and it, nothing really happens or, you know, it doesn't bite me, but it's not really that big of a difference between what I was expecting, what actually happened. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Yeah. Uh, another question that we have here is, what is the function of some of the other eating related safety behaviors that you mentioned, um, such as slow or quicken, quickened pace of eating or excessive small bites of food? So I think a lot of those eating related behaviors, I think I mentioned this initially are often are tied to this law, this fear of loss of control. So that's often what we'll see. Um, if we're thinking about like slow or quickened pace of eating, um, if someone's eating really, um, really fast, it could be to also escape a negative emotions that they're feeling during that eating episode. Um, if someone's eating really slow, another function could be, um, I'm going to try to get full over less food. So if I really extend this out, maybe I can achieve that satiation or fullness before I have to eat the whole meal. Um, the small bites of food, often I think the most common thing we see with that is the loss of control, fearing loss of control. But you might also see that with folks who might be afraid of choking, um, something like that. Um, it could also be um, like a maximization of the experience. So sometimes we find this is pretty common for folks when um, they are weight suppressed or have been in the semi-starvation period that there is this desire to maximize the eating experience. So if I take really small bites of food and I eat this really slowly, maybe I can like, I can make this last as long as possible and enjoy this as long as possible with the fewest amount of calories that I can consume. Um, so those, with those two that you mentioned, those would be the things I think are most common. I might just add too that we also have a number of individuals um, with the overlap of OCD, hmm. where the OCD ends up, um, you know, involving their eating process, and uh, so there may be elaborate rituals taking place hmm. at the meal time, either in preparation of the food or in the eating of the food, um, that ends up being a, a factor of their OCD, maybe even more so than uh, some of their more traditional anorexia nervosa or or body image related uh, fears that someone might be having. That's a great point. 
Thank you both so much. We have so many great questions that are coming through. Um, but unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for questions. So if we didn't get to your question, uh, please feel free to send me an email to webinars at rogersbh.org. And many thanks to our presenters, Dr. Hill and Dr. Smith for taking the time away from your clinical practice to share your valuable insights with us. Helping a patient on the road to recovery means collaboration among everyone involved in their treatment. With locations across the country, our treatment teams are ready to partner with you. Rogers's outreach representatives are also available and they're happy to answer any questions that you may have regarding our treatment services, as well as to learn more about your practice. Um, before we conclude, I'd like to ask our presenters to share a few take home messages with our participants. Um, so, so a few things on the exposure side, um, this can be a really helpful adjunct to treatment. Um, I've seen it be hugely beneficial in my practice. Um, doing a thorough functional assessment is really the foundation and the thing that you need in order to develop a strong hierarchy. Um, and remembering to utilize some of those components of the inhibitory learning model with eating disorders in, in a similar way as you would with anxiety disorders. And then from the medication part of the presentation, I would say it's important to be cognizant of how exposure therapy works to know how the medications can fit into that. Consider comorbid psychiatric conditions in how you choose medications and consider antidepressants and augmentation strategies that are aimed at those co-occurring diagnoses, especially when somebody has severe symptoms. And then consider acute anxiety reducing medications to make exposure work possible in the early stages to help it be challenging but manageable, but also need to stay cognizant of the risks that you might be presenting or interfering with the exposure work. So a lot of collaboration among the entire team about how things are going from both the therapy and the medication uh, aspects of the treatment. Thank you so much. And that about wraps it up, everyone. I wanna take a moment to remind our participants that those of you who meet the required time commitment will be eligible for CE credits. Within the next 30 minutes, you will receive an email with a link to your personal dashboard on ce-go.com, where you will be able to access PDFs of the PowerPoint slides as a handout and a complete list of references. Those of you who met the time requirement to qualify for CE credits will need to complete the evaluation to download your CE certificate for the event. If you have any questions about this follow-up email, please contact support at ce-go.com. And on behalf of everyone at Rogers, we look forward to partnering with you to help support your patients. Thanks so much and have a wonderful weekend.